started. We want to welcome everyone watching this program on replay and thank you for joining us. I'm Steve, the bookman Eisenstein, and this is the Rare Book Cafe, the first and only Blab TV program in the entire world about antiquarian books. Thank you for joining us on Blab.im. The Rare Book Cafe is brought to you by the Florida Antiquarian Book Fair. My new regular guest today and co-host, I guess we're going to have to make up a new word and call it a tri-host, <laughs> is Lindsay Thompson of Henry Bemis Books. Thorne Donnelly is still out there at book school. When he comes back, we can't wait to hear what he has to say. And later in the program, Edie's got a couple of things to say about a new miniature book catalog coming out by Oak Knoll. Um, Mike, have we ever done the third degree with you? <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay, so we are not going to do the third degree again. As always, through the miracle of modern technology, visitors to our live show can send texts and comments, so click away. We'll be watching. If you have a question about a book in your house, if you have a book on a, a question on anything that's paper printed or in the wonderful world of rare books, ask it. This is one of the few places in the world where you can get an impartial answer, and we'd be happy to tell you what you have. Um, so if you have a question, type it into the message bar. We'll be watching. The pair of hands that you see in the corner of each screen represents a blow, like an applause meter. If you like what the person is saying, by all means, let us know. And if you're new to the program and wanted to be alerted about other episodes of the Rare Book Cafe, be sure to follow us on Blab, Twitter, and other developing social media. Finally, this program is being recorded so you and your friends can watch the replay on Blab or on the Florida Antiquarian Book Fair blog at floridabookfair.blogspot.com. That's floridabookfair.blogspot.com. And now it's time for what we call the Hidden Treasures segment of the show. Book dealers, bookstores, we're always buying, we're always selling. And like major libraries, occasionally we don't lose four Beatrix Potter's original drawings that were later found in a book, but there's always stuff we do find in the store. So, Mike, what have you been finding in the store around in the world? Uh, thanks very much. Uh, first of all, Lindsay, I was just up in sort of your neck of the woods recently. Uh, I was up in Richmond to a, a Civil War show. Uh, oh. I took a lot of our Civil War books up there, uh, mm -hmm. went up with my grandson, and we had a great time uh, with all the the books and the bullets and the swords <laughs> and, and all the rest of it. A lot of people don't realize how different Civil War battlefields are. And in the Charlotte area where I grew up, we have Revolutionary War battlefields. So when I was a boy, I was accustomed to fields like King's Mountain or Cowpens, which you can walk around in an hour or two. Right. And when I was a teenager, my family went to Texas for a family vacation. We spent a night in Vicksburg across from the entrance to the park. My dad said, let your mom sleep in. Let's go see the park. So we started off up the driveway, and half an hour later, we reached the visitor center on foot. My dad <laughs> said, "My dad said, look around. I'm going to get the car. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. And, and Steve, I was down near you not too long ago with the um, the RBMS uh, conference, the rare book and manuscript section of the uh, American Library or what is it, American College Library Association, which was an interesting thing, a, a gathering of many of the rare book librarians from all around the country and um, it too was a, an interesting and, and fun uh, several days down there it was in Coral Gables uh, just in at, the beautiful, neighborhood. at the beautiful Bill Moore Hotel how was it what was the traffic like on the show and... well, it, well it was interesting um, of course you say traffic, it was, of course, limited to the number of special collections librarians that were there. But it, there were several hundred of them. And it um, and they were at seminars, um, 
many parts of the day and then would would float through the area. There were probably 35 or 40 um, sort of mini stands, mini being little stands. And each of us were given four or five minutes to make a little presentation to the various librarians. And um, so it, a good time was had by all, I guess, is the way to say it. Mike, are you aware that November 5th, there is a Florida memorabilia show at the Carl Gables Museum? And would you like me to send you the information on it? Sure. No, I, I had no idea. OK. Um, I will send you the email on it. We're planning to be there. Um, it's the Miami Memorabilia Club. But from what I gather, it's going to they it's going to be anything related to Florida. There's only going to be about a dozen people there. Um, after the show, I will send you the email they sent me because we're planning to do it. It's Saturday, November 5th. It's just a one day show. Mm -hmm. But they are looking. There actually were several of those sorts of things here in the St. Petersburg area in years past, five or ten years ago, um, and, and and they are a lot of fun because of all the the pink flamingos and the the alligator canes and what have you. There, they're lots of fun. In addition to all of the memorabilia that would have been for the roadside attractions. It's, it, it's just, they're all a lot of fun to go to. Yeah, specialty shows are. I, I, the few, I don't do, I used to do a lot of gun shows, um, you know, with books, but um, anytime we've ever done a specialty show, as you say, it has a, a unique flavor to it. Mm -hmm. What has walked in the doors lately at Lighthouse Books in St. Petersburg, Florida? Well, it, it, um, not long before the RBMS show in Coral Gables, we visited um, some folks up in the Gainesville area, and I purchased um, an interesting collection of um, the man had studied the history of surgery and specifically gunshot wounds. And so there are um, books from as early as 1555. Um, this one's uh, Conrad Gessner compiled a number of uh, surgical works into a volume in 1555. And it included a fellow named Alfonso Ferry, who did a whole section on gunshot wounds. Wow. Uh, the fellow who put the collection together was interesting because he made, well, he wrote 300 or more articles on ballistics and gunshot wounds and surgery. He was a military surgeon himself. And um, he's the fellow who his studies are primarily responsible for our soldiers and police people um, wearing Kevlar vests uh, these days. And um, it, it, it just, well, it, it, you can see. <laughs> this is a, one of the woodcut illustrations from it. You can see the, the smiling. Uh, wow. there. I'm gonna, I, if it wasn't, I'd go inside and get my vest and put it on for this portion of the program. <laughs> <laughs> I, re I really have one. <laughs> Dad, Alfonso was one of the earliest people to write on gunshot wounds. There is also... Um, Mike, did you find, I know we, I think we spoke about this a little earlier. Did you find the 18, did you find the 1898 GPO report? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. It, it, it's there also. And this is Ambrose Paré's uh, works. Um, he also was a military surgeon. 
and responsible for an awful lot of the changes. Um, he stopped people cauterizing the wounds and um, invented several instruments to extract arquebus bullets. <laughs> yes, from the conicals, the square yeah. bullets for the pagans and the round ones for the Christians. Was that the way the words went, I think, in the war then? Yeah. Um, were any of these books in, in were any of these books um, unknown copies, or there are copies of these in other collections uh, hitherto there, unknown? There are other collections. In fact, that was um, when I went down to the Coral Gables uh, gathering. My thought was that I would like to have this um, passed on as a collection. It turns out that there was considerable interest in individual volumes, but just as you say, the places that had uh, surgical or ballistic uh, collections already had a portion of these books. So ultimately, the collection will be broken up and placed hither and yon but hopefully uh, filling in gaps in already existing collections. And no, none of them were only known copies or anything of that nature. It is true that a book like Paré's works from 1628 was such an influential book that most of them were read to pieces. And so to have a copy that's mostly together or in a nice old binding, that sort of thing, is a little unusual. Uh, but the collection went on up to the present day. It, um, there are books there. Well, here's one from uh, the war in South Africa. And that's specifically about gunshot wounds in the South African war? Well, uh, sort of. Uh, okay. It's the surgical reminiscences. Um, well, it's entitled Surgical Experiences in South Africa, 1899 to 1900. So uh, it's, it's many different kinds of war wounds. Uh, and there's uh, treatment of war wounds, 1918, which would be World War I. And here's medico-surgical aspects wow. of the Spanish-American. Uh, how many how many books? Uh, go ahead, go ahead. A few hundred. Wow. And Want to see something in, funny, and then I'll give it back. Spanish-American War. I mean, it 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 really traces the the history of gunshot wounds through throughout history. May, may I add some humor to this conversation? Sure. Shoot. See the bullet in the spine of this book right there? <laughs> I bought that book somewhere in downtown Miami, and I noticed the bullet in the spine of the book. I've shown this before, but you know, it definitely fits it. Alan, you were going to say something. I'm sorry. I was just going to ask uh, Mike to hold the bite, those books closer so that we could see them closer to the screen. Ah. Okay. That's a phenomenal collection uh, from top to bottom, a wide price range. Um, there, there's some $10 books in there and there's some ones that are six, 7,000, something of that nature. Wow. Mm -hmm. Good luck on the cell. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, just before we went up to the civil war, um, show, uh, and most of those books are still packed, of course. Um, we did buy a Civil War collection as well. And I, I have fallen in love with um, Douglas Southall Freeman, mm. uh, who is a historian that we all know, uh, wrote a number of different things. He, he he published his first book, I believe, in 1908, at the time that he graduated with his doctorate. Um, I think it was from Princeton or Columbia, one of the two. 
in any case, um, in the early 30s, he published um, the biography, R.E. Lee, the four volumes that we see from time to time, and won a Pulitzer Prize. Uh, later, he published the three-volume work of Lee's Lieutenants. Still later, in the 50s, he won a, another Pulitzer for his six-volume uh, work on Washington. There was a seventh volume added later. But um, so he won two Pulitzer Prizes years apart. But that's only part of the story. The other part is that d while he was doing all of this writing, he was the editor of the Richmond newspaper, the news leader, I believe, and wrote 600,000 words a year uh, in editorial responses. And in addition to that, <laughs> <laughs> he, um, in the mid 20s started a radio show uh, and on Saturdays worked a half hour uh, live that turned into around 1929 I believe a twice a day during the weekdays uh, 15 minute live radio show uh, that he continued for 30 or 40 years strictly on the Civil War no, no. Well, military history in general is wow. what he commented on. Um, and, and of course, uh, was in touch and, and carried on a, a great um, correspondence with many of the other military historians. Of course, World War II was going on during part of the time. But, um, you know, there, there's a name that we've all seen on a spine of a book because those books do turn up. But um, here, here's a man who really had a phenomenal life. He also raised a family at the same time and the kids did interesting things as well. So, you know, he took care and pride with them. Um, as I say, um, I, I've fallen in love with him uh, for all of the things that he was able to accomplish in the, the 40 years or so that he was there. I've got two more in addition to that for you. During, yeah. during World War II, he was also an advisor to the Pentagon on war planning. And he taught at Columbia and flew back and forth to New York twice a week when almost nobody flew commercially. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I can only add that books travel in cycles. I also found Civil War this week. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It is, it is um, the history of the New Jersey Volunteers. Ah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Original cloth, fairly nice, little wear on the spine. But in a garage sale, I have no price, no problems. <laughs> No problem. Alan left again. Okay. What else, Mike? What else has been going on? Oh, my goodness. I, having been traveling a bit, I'm um, mostly I'm trying to catch up <laughs> with the things here and, and uh, put together our orders and all of that sort of thing. Do you, do you have any feet? Do you have any fairs that you're going to be at? Um, I will be up in Atlanta uh, in September for the Atlanta Book Fair. I believe that's Labor Day weekend. And um, that, that's a funny fair. It has been through an awful lot of incarnations. And um, the most recent one, I believe, is probably going to be successful or as successful as uh, any of them have been. It's in conjunction with the Decatur Book Festival um, that takes place sort of up the hill. And um, down where we are is in the Fellowship Hall of a, of the, a nearby church. And um, 
but it's uh it's always fun and um atlanta has always been good to me <laughs> where i know i just made arrangements with rochester to do the book fair there on books last year gaba we did gaba um maybe there's a way we can get gaba on this show for next year i mean for you know for coming up i i'm sure there is i absolutely i, I would talk to some of the people up there, David Hamilton seems to be the, the point person for uh, the Georgia Antiquarian Book Fair. Yes, we'll, we'll be inviting um, a number of the, the book dealers uh, uh, from Georgia to be on the show. Some of them have been on the show before, and I'm sure they will be uh, happy to come back and talk about the, the upcoming book fair. Underground Books, I remember the name. I can't remember his name, but it's Underground Josh, Books. Josh. 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 Yes, Josh. Josh. Yes. Yeah. And it, if you've not read, um, his, Josh's wife, whose name has escaped me at the moment, wrote a wonderful uh, blog uh, on her experience at the Colorado Antiquarian Book School. And uh, it, it it's really well done. I can't emphasize that enough and gives you a real flavor for what can be done there and all of that. Uh, she really did a good job. And she she's, um, I think she's going to be a great bookseller in her own right. Yeah, I enjoy person. talking with them. Yeah. Yes, yeah, they were a delight to talk to. Just a reminder for everybody, April 21st, 22nd, and 23rd of 2017 is the new date for the Florida Antiquarian Book Fair. So be sure to mark that on your calendar. Um, any new words or anything about what's going to be going on as far as Sunlit Festival or any, any announcements or we're too early yet? It, it's a little early yet. Uh the Sunlit Festival will continue to be a part of, yes. well, the book fair will continue to be a part of Sunlit Festival uh, that happens here in St. Petersburg. This will be the third year for the Sunlit Festival and the 36th year for the Florida Antiquarian Book Fair. Uh, it's always a great event. Uh, there are always more than 100 exhibitors from all around the country. It's one of the, the most diverse book fairs in the country, simply because people come from everywhere. Whereas, Mike, you, you remember, uh, you know, you, you've you been there since the beginning. You remember whether there was uh, ever any exhibitors from Charlotte, uh, North Carolina? Yes, but I can't remember. <laughs> there, it's sure. Um, the problem is that the one or two that I can remember no longer have bookstores. Something, something has. Alan, we're looking at your foot. <laughs> <laughs> looking at your foot, Alan. Well, <laughs> they, I wonder if there are any book dealers in Charlotte who would uh, be interested in coming to the book fair. I'd be a little surprised, personally. Charlotte is a severely underserved market, given that it's the third fastest growing city in America. The really good bookstores in this town, you can count on one hand. And there's there's uh, one dealer in Asheville that does some uh, work in uh, collectible books, one up in the Greensboro, Winston-Salem area, one down around Chapel Hill. But it's uh, really... A, a market waiting to be developed in a lot of ways. You know, Charlotte is awash in money these days. Uh, we import all the talent that we need for banking and high tech and everything else. Uh, they just haven't figured out yet that books are a nifty thing to get involved with. They will. I'm hoping so. There's a, there's a, there's a uh, kind of an uh, evangelist of, uh, of book collecting up there, I understand. What's his name? Tom, uh, Thompson, I think. Uh, 
Well, he, he's a, he, so far he's a prophet without honor in his own country. <laughs> <laughs> my, my memories of Asheville, Caroline, the Carolines was digging for what were we digging for up there? Emeralds, rubies? What are we? All of the above. Yeah, yeah, and I one of a one of us, not to be mentioned, said, "I'm going to carry my own dirt." Proceeded to slide down the mountain, and when we got home about six weeks later, we found out she had broken her ankle. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, I live I live about a mile from a uh, one of the oldest gold mines in North Carolina, the Caps Hill Mine, which uh, this area was in the 1820s to the 1840s so prolific in producing gold that we had a U.S. Mint in Charlotte, which is now a museum. And the, the Caps Hill Mine is uh, still a, a functioning outfit for aggregate gravel mainly. It belongs to the Martin Marietta Corporation. And it's the deepest place, the, the lowest elevation in the county. And occasionally, even a mile away, when they uh, need to shake loose some more gravel, we, we kind of feel it around here. Lindsay, you're jumping up on down. They just set off another charge. <laughs> I was I was indulging visual comic aids. <laughs> but it's it it is an interesting market here. You know, there's a great bookstore down in South Carolina called Books Tell You Why, which yes. does brilliant things on the internet. They really have one of the best websites for somebody who wants to get into collecting. Jo Joachim. Um, is uh, one of our favorite uh, uh, exhibitors at the Florida Book Fair. Mm -hmm. They're my next door neighbor in the Elko. He is, indeed. Yeah, he is. Yeah. And then we have, one, there, uh, we have one auction house down in the Chapel Hill area that does a lot of books, but it's a fairly minimal amount of their overall business. And unless you are dealing in lots or collections, they tend not to have a lot of interest in in single books no matter what their value may be so it's this is an area i think that has a lot of potential and i'm hoping to live long enough to tap a little of it <laughs> i i've seen i don't know i don't know what to say about miami from that aspect um it used to be there were easily 10 or 12 very viable stores you know between fort lauderdale and here dade county this year, in the beginning of the year, when the September or so, when the phone books came out, I noticed a couple of things. One, there was not one display ad anymore, but I guess that's the way of computers that you're not displaying in the yellow pages. There were about 15 telephone numbers that I called every one of them to ask them to be a guest on the show. <laughs> And without a failure, the same reason they wouldn't be on was the same reason for the first call in the last call. Ding, I'm sorry, the number you had called has been disconnected. That's, that's what I was greeted with. So, you know, I don't know what to say about Miami. Um, well, they all got know. cell phones, Stephen. They just all yeah. got cell phones. Up here, one of the big challenges is just being able to stay in one place for very long. Charlotte is growing and has grown historically so fast that it's difficult to find a, a neighborhood for very long that isn't going to gentrify and upgrade. Uh, when I went into business under my own hat two years ago, I had in mind trying to get into the Plaza Midwood neighborhood, which is a few miles outside uh, uptown Charlotte close to Central Piedmont Community College. Very bohemian, up-and-coming kind of neighborhood. But it's, uh, it has priced me out in a year and a half. Uh, apartment buildings go up one a week. And it's pretty much that way all over town. Uh, there was a woman that I used to talk to about space, possibly space sharing, who had a vintage costume shop in that neighborhood. She's now in Monroe, North Carolina, 25 miles down the road. Rents just keep going up and up and up, and you know I uh, I have to to look in terms of if I want to go into a storefront at some point, how far out can I go and anybody still come to see me? Mm -hmm. well, the, uh, the book fair in, 
the book fair in uh, in Georgia goes all the way out to there in Decatur, right? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I, and <clears throat> and, uh, and I and the it's not only the uh, antiquarian book fair, but the uh, book fair that's sponsored by the the uh, uh, Atlanta Constitution is, uh, and they've gone out out to there because that's where the uh, reasonable reasonable spaces are. Mm-hmm. Um, you you used the word gentrification before. I don't have the desire anymore to open up a retail store, but I am always looking for consignment locations. So I tell you, Wynwood. I don't know if you hear this name. Wynwood is the new Lincoln Road art colony. That's where Art Basel has its, you know, uh, sat the big satellite. What a wonderful that. area down there, too, and I I really enjoy it. We went there two days ago with the express purpose of scouting out would I want to go into this store and have a consignment location there. That was our goal driving around. When I realized what I was looking at, the first thing I want to say is we didn't see it all by any means. We were in the older part that is the furthest away from the gentrification process that has already started. There was not one store that I thought I would have wanted to be in that we saw. Why? Because everything around it, there was two or three stores with big murals painted on the building, and they were functioning. To the left, to the right, and behind, there were all shell structures waiting to be either further gutted or completely torn down. They still got a lot of work to do there, but, uh, but they're yeah. well and, on their but way. Here's the thing. Yes, Pig, yes, and I'm not not That is here. the name of the area. Winwood, Winwood, and and what's it's happening? It's an industrial though, area in, back in was. the day, and still a lot of it still is. Mm-hmm. And, and it's only because of Art Basel that they got exposed the way they did. The major satellite shows were renting out these defunct factories, charging twenty thousand dollars a booth. You know. And, you know, what was their overhead other than this shell building? But what happens in Miami, and I don't don't think it's any different anywhere else, is this. The artists will come in. They will slave. They will give their blood, guts, and tears to build up the area. It will be built up. The developers will come in and kick them out because they can't afford the rent. And the art colony, you know, in 15 years, will win would go the way of Lincoln Road. And, and instead of being the artist hangout that it would have been, is it now, like the store that I had on Lincoln Road in 1987, the rent for that store was $750 a month. The rent for the exact same store right now is $15,000 a month and probably a percentage the it. It's a I'm cycle. Just out, it's yeah, a cycle. that's all I'm saying. It's a cycle. Um, well, you know, I'll, I'll let you know more about Winwood because there were areas that I knew that I wanted to go in, but we started, you know, we decided to grid it up and we started in this area so we don't have to go back to it. But you're, I know probably, I, I, you're probably a little bit ahead of the curve, but you probably would be better off being a little bit ahead of the curve than uh, than waiting till it uh, and, and then rise, riding the crest because eventually you know what's going to happen with it. You'd be better off to uh, start a little bit early and ride that crest. So I, avoid I the been, fifteen thousand a month. I've been told I'm always <laughs> ahead of my time, which is probably why I'm not driving a Lamborghini. <laughs> it doesn't do any good to be ahead of your time. You got to hit it on the head. <laughs> well, I lived in Portland and Seattle for thirty years, and back then there were lots and lots of bookstores, lots of indie book uh, film places. And now that's all condos and, and uh, programmers for Amazon. And the old neighborhood I lived in on Capitol Hill in Seattle is like a big frat house now. Only everybody's paying 3000 or 4000 bucks a month for a condo. And I'm going to get one now. Listen, I'm going to take, if I may, I'm going to take a break for a minute. And I'm going to introduce Edie to the audience because 
Oh no, books just came out with a catalog of miniature books, and we just want to tell the audience about it. But since miniature books are Edie's thing, I'll be right back. Here comes Edie. Hello, Alan. Hi. Hi. Hello, Michael. Hi there. Hello, Lindsay. Hi. It's good to see you all. As you often it's say, good it's good to, to be seen. seen. <laughs> I never want to know. Uh, I wanted uh, to say that last week when I put out that UFO book in Oz, and I tried and tried and tried to find the publisher, and it seems that that publisher is now no longer in business. There is a Ford Press, but it's in Leesburg, Florida. And they knew about this other Ford Press, but they said to the best of their knowledge, it is no longer in business. Then, Thorn, wherever you are, I hope you're listening. Thorn Donnelly called me last week to tell me that Oak Knoll Books was coming out with a new miniature book catalog wow. and he said Edie, I know that you'll want it so I said okay so I called Oak Knoll Books and I spoke to a gentleman there who just had a 10 month old baby so he will not be going to the conclave but they just bought a 2700 collection of miniature books and they are putting out a catalog on that collection. They had already put out one volume on miniature books, but they have no more of that left. But he was going to send me a copy of the second volume of miniature books. And what I don't know, you guys are smarter than I am, but it seems as if whenever you talk about books on books, you always think about Oak Knoll books and they carry big, huge, gorgeous things. You go on their site and you see these things and they're phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Well, their new specialty is going to be to concentrate on miniature books. Oh, that's great. And, and not the big books anymore. So we had a very good conversation about miniature books. And to the best of my knowledge, Michael or Lindsley or Alan, you might know, there's no miniature book price guide. Oh. Mike, do you know? I've not heard of one. Lindsley? I have not heard of one. Neither have I, and I've tried to find out. And that's why when I get one of these catalogs, I just devour it and look and say, oh, look, there's a book that I have. And so... Maybe you um, may have to create one. No, not me. Not me. Hmm? That, uh, that would be a job. I had suggested it to Karen Nyman. Karen Nyman has been the president of the Miniature Book Society. She said it's... And I love her catalog. I've shown them on my little segment of this program, too. And she said that it would be too overwhelming to do. I suggested it to Hank Holt and Jim Bisbeck from Isaiah Thomas book. No, no, no. <laughs> and I suggested it to Michael Barber, who is also, he started me on miniature books. Michael is from England. And I got my first miniature book at the Florida Antiquarian show from Michael Barber many years ago. So, but he also said that the price guide would be an astronomical thing. But I'm going to call the guy back at Oak Knoll Books and suggest it to him. So maybe they'll do it. But that's all that I was going to say today that anybody out there that's looking for a new miniature book catalog, they've got one. And their phone number is 302-328-7232. You need to say that again, Edie. Uh, there was breakup. 
302-328-7232. They're closed today because I tried to call them to tell them that I was going to mention it on today's <laughs> show. And they're closed over the weekend. Their hours are Monday through Friday. And Michael, I wanted to say to you that the pictures of your grandchildren on Facebook <laughs> are, I mean, you've just got gorgeous kids, so you've got good genes there. <laughs> well, you know, I always love Sarah, you know, and Sarah is always a beauty, so good for you for posting them. I've really enjoyed that. And Lindsley, it is so good to see you. Well, thank you very much. You are very welcome. But, you know, the hunt is the fun. And miniature books, I did appreciate Dorn calling me because he heard about the miniature book catalog at whatever class he is currently taking. So I'll be getting it, and I'll be waving it here probably next week to say, see, I did get it, and look what I got, this treasure. <laughs> I hope you're all having a great day and good weather, and Stephen is now tapping me, so it's time for me to go. But Thank I will you, see Evie. you. Yeah, I'll see you next week. Good to see you. Okay. While we're in transition here, Alan, can I ask a quick question? Sure. Mr. Brower, the gentleman I mentioned last night, sent me a note on Facebook that Blab won't let him in. I sent him a link to this page that we are on right now. I don't know if that'll do it or not. Do you have any suggestions on what he might do? That's the best uh, thing to do, but he has to be on a, um, a Firefox browser or a Chrome browser. If he's on anything else, it won't let him in. I'll try that. And, uh, and he also needs to be sure that he's, if he's going to use uh, uh, Twitter as the login, then he needs to make sure that he has Twitter open on his machine when he starts to try to log in. Okay. I'll let him know that as well. Okay. I got a question, Mike. Do you remember a book deal? He mentioned her, but I, I looked at the book to get the complete name. Alla T. Ford. Does that name ring a bell to you? Sure. Yes. yes. From where? Uh, Was she a Florida book dealer? Uh, well, is she part of the time, yes. Originally, she was, and I can't tell you where up north she was from, but she did um, spend 10 or 20 years in sort of semi-retirement in near Orlando is, is where she was. She sort of specialized in um, science fiction and fantasy, if I remember correctly. And, uh, and she also had miniature books, I believe as well. But, yeah, yeah, that was, that's the one who produced the Oz books. You wouldn't remember the name of her business by any chance, would you? Something like forgotten I, I think volumes she did under her own name, I think. Okay, then no, I'm trying to cross reference something else in my mind. Many years ago, when I had this store on Lincoln Road, I named the store Many Acquaint and Forgotten Volume Books, which was hell on checks. I mean, it was really hard to write that out. But somewhere I got a notice, and this was back in the days of the AB Book News Weekly. Somebody said, they, we, I was using their name or something or a paraphrase from it. And for some reason, I thought it was her. But if you're telling me science fiction and miniatures, then I don't, I'm not sure it was. But I, I was curious. Thanks for the history update on that one. <laughs> Lindsay, did you have anything walking through the door this week? Through the I had a couple of things that were kind of interesting. Uh, you know, one of the... Uh, Things that always surprises me, particularly in this convention season, uh, is how quickly we forget things that have happened in the not so distant past. And things that are essentially just repetitions or continuations of 
past disputes and old events are seen as something new under the sun. And it, you know, things move so fast now that 50 years ago seems unimaginable to most people. And yet we can probably, the three of us all, remember it fairly lucidly. And one of the things that uh, made me think of this uh, was a couple of books that came in on polio. And in the 40s and 50s, that was a field of literature because you know, in the World War II era, particularly the after the war, or really from the 30s on and through the war, uh, it was a big national problem because it would strike randomly in cities and could lay low tens of thousands of people. And so two books came in that were kind of interesting, both from North Carolina. Um, One is uh, by a high school principal. This came out from the Broadman Press in Nashville in 1960, and it's called We Made Peace with Polio. And it's basically just a first-person narrative about how in Brevard, North Carolina, in the 50s, this principal heard rumors that polio was in the area. It hit the area. Next thing you know, his own daughter was one of the people who came down with it. And it's as books go, it's it's no collector's item. It's been pretty beat up. But it's a fascinating glimpse into both regional history, which is one of the things I concentrate on, and a facet of life that we now f have forgotten. We don't really take for granted that we could be struck by a random disease. And I can remember when I was a little kid 50-odd years ago, going over with my parents to John W. McLaughlin Elementary School in Rayford, North Carolina, to do the Sabin vaccine on a sugar cube. And it seemed like everybody in Hope County was lined up that night to get one. And there was just a palpable sense of national relief when that vaccine finally went into circulation. The other book, this is a more recent one. It came out in 2006. It's by Martha Mason, and it's called Breath. And it's about her life in an iron lung. And as far as anyone can tell, she spent longer in an iron lung than anybody in history, just over 60 years. Oh, my goodness. And she grew up just up the road from Shelby, where I was a kid. And, you know, at the time that she uh, was stricken, uh, polio was uh, something where your, your your lung capacity was severely reduced, and they would put you in these big iron tubes that essentially maintained air pressure. And I can remember in soap operas and movies when I was a kid, there was always somebody in an iron lung, and I would I remember to this day thinking, my God, that must be the most awful fate in the world. Of course, I didn't realize that those people had no feeling from the chest or the neck down. And so they didn't really know whether they were locked in this box or not. I, as a rambunctious little kid with claustrophobia, just was panicked by it. But Martha Mason grew up in a little town north of Shelby, North Carolina. And even as medical advances made it possible for her to have some degree of liberation from that, she found it worked for her and she just stayed. And she ended up becoming a principal caregiver for her parents as they aged. Community just included her as part of their routine, caregiving, checking when the power went up. She was able, as computers came in, to master one uh, breath, with breath control. Uh, she uh, was able to go to college, get a degree, and then she decided she was going to write her memoirs. And so it's a fascinating book about this woman who lay in a big iron tube in a room in her house most of her life and yet had a very full life. She would have dinner parties, and they'd roll her in next to the dining room table, and everybody just said, well, that's Martha's having another party. So, you know, there are all these little byways of history that are illuminated by, by old books, and uh, that's one of the things I find fascinating about book selling in general and being in the Carolinas as well, because another related field we have here is histories of mill towns. 
Those are all gone now. Just in my lifetime, that industry that I started working in when I was 16 has gone away. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what it has left behind is a rich history of memoirs by people who grew up in them. The churches that were in them, the people who lived there, uh, president of Winter College, uh, Billy, uh, his name escapes me just now, but maybe we can talk about these histories some week. We had a wonderful history of a little town called Robberdale, North Carolina, that we used to drive through all the way to my grandmother's house. It doesn't exist anymore. The mill's gone, everything closed up, but there's still a Robberdale reunion every year for the people and their descendants who grew up in that place. Oh my. And so books preserve those memories that are, are almost lost or sometimes completely lost and remind us of things like what it was like when every single summer, every parent in America worried about his or her kids going outside and catching polio, however you got it. At that point, they didn't even know how you got it. Yeah. But it was the worst thing in the world if you did. Yeah. I, I remember you had a sugar cube. I don't know who's older, you or I, but I had... I remember the experience of getting a shot, and it's probably why I hate needles to this day. That needle looked like a huh? screwdriver that my father would use to work on a mechanical device or something. It was either I was very little or it was very big. Just to change the subject from polio back to book collecting, I'm only joking with you on that. I found a really interesting book that I am kind of tempted to read because there are some things in there that I think I'd like to know. And it is the history of the New York the New York Society Library, or basically the history of the New York Library. Um, it came with the same library that the Civil War book came from, and it's by an interesting press called the Divinity Press. If you're familiar with the name, um, they've done quite a few works over time. This is a limited edition. Um, there's a colophone statement in the back. I think it was 500, um, which really surprised me. I didn't expect to see it. This copy is an edition of 500 books. And I'm very happy with the condition, considering that it is a Florida book, you know. But <laughs> there's a lot of things in here. I've been kind of, you know, with the show, I'm, I'm always looking for angles to research. And there's a lot of things of other literary societies that probably got off the ground but didn't make it as far as like the Grawler Club or other things that are probably discussed in this book. So much as it reminds me of Shogun, a novel I never read, <laughs> <laughs> I um, I won't try and get through this thing during the next uh, few weeks. That and the uh, the book that we men we do not mention the title of are the only two books that you never <laughs> read, right? Fiction is not my forte. What can I say? You know, I did enough stuff in my life. I don't have to read about somebody else's dreams. Or, you know, I don't read it that way, but, you know, I'm, I'm content with my life. I could probably write a novel that would get me in a lot of trouble, you know, <laughs> or a semi biography. You know. Is that book that whose name we cannot mention the literary equivalent of? Actors not saying Macbeth? No, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll explain the story to you. <laughs> when the show first started, when books first started, is an entertainment director and is a rare book dealer, I knew I had to have dramatic examples of very well-known books that people that knew the book and the title didn't have a clue about the actual value. Now, what could be more innocuous than the book I'm not allowed to mention anymore? The Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald. $377,000. I'm sorry, Mike? I'm, I'm leaving. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> it is bad luck. Yeah. On, on that note, um, you know, what could be more? Alcoholics Anonymous, things like that. So I always joke that I mentioned the book, but I never read it. You know, I mean, um, we did our required reading in high school and college. I was called the king of symbolism in any class that I went to, you know, where we were discussing literature. But when I hit the dirt running in Miami Beach after I dropped out of college, 
I probably could have written a few novels at that time myself, and the trouble would have been they weren't novels. You know what I mean? They weren't novels. I just don't enjoy fiction. I don't know. I don't know how to say it. You know, I never learned how to play chess either. I'm a phenomenal, was a phenomenal backgammon player, but I always said I never understood the movement in chess, and I always used to say, if I ever broke my leg snow skiing, but I don't do winter sports, that's when I would learn chess when I was ground. I wish I could play chess. Thank God. Thank God I never broke anything. You know? I will be so, right back. Well, I'll tell you what, Alan, we're close to the end. Okay. Well, if that's a... God, well, I'll wait. I'll wait. If that's a rush. Okay. You got it. It'll just be a moment. I'll be right back. No problem. <laughs> Well, let me talk about things in the future. Next week on the Rare Book Cafe, our guest will be Gigi Beth Richardson. Um, as far as I know, on Books on the Bookshelf, we are going to be revisited by Abby Schoolman, whose book, Timothy E. Lee, Eight Books, just came out. And other things down the road, as you heard us talk about, we're hopefully going to be covering various book fairs from Rochester to um, Georgia. And if we can work it out, we would try and have people on the radio program joining us right afterwards on the Rare Book Cafe. That would be an ideal goal. So we hope that you, the audience, stay with us. Remember, if you have questions on rare books, this is one of the few places where you can get them answered for free and on camera. And I guess Alan's in Mike's store right now. I can see what's happening. I think so. He said yeah, he was yeah, going yeah. down to help get things set up. Yeah, yeah, okay. And he's coming back in. What's going on at Mike's store, Alan? What's going on at Mike's store that you're setting up there? The thing that, uh, that uh, we all, all want in our stores is, uh, is happening. He has customers. Oh, oh no! I thought there was an event or something. No, no, no. That I no, no, the way you, Lindsay, the way you said it, I thought you know something. I didn't know there was a party or something going on. I might have missed it. What is it? Oh, I figured it was that you said that book name and he had yeah. to leave. Yeah, I know. That's what I figured it was. So if I get one more, yeah, I know. I know. I know, I know, I know. Um, but you asked. <laughs> I didn't volunteer. Ladies and gentlemen, we want to thank you for joining us today on the Rare Book Cafe. Be sure to join us again next week, same time, same station, BLAB.IM. Our guest will be Gigi Beth Richardson. You will see us, um, myself, Thorne Donnelly, Lindsay. It's always a pleasure. Um, Lindsay, is, Lindsay is a new member of the cast and crew, and we want to thank you for joining us and everything that you're going to be doing with us. And thank you. Oh, thank you. And and by the way, the couch was very comfortable. <laughs> it's okay, the Mile High Club. Huh? <laughs> Alan, any closing comments? Not at all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Alan. Right, goodbye, everyone. Happy book sales to you.